You know, no matter what game I cover in this retrospective, you can almost count on one person or ten in the comments section arguing their own personal definition of the genre Resident Evil popularized and named survival horror. This all started when I began to cover the games released post-Code Veronica, a time when RE was ditching its slow-paced atmospheric themes for the more average third-person shooter mechanics. And there will always be a person who will argue that these games still keep with the spirit of the genre and, well, fair enough. I'm certainly not bold enough to say my opinions are gospel, so I'm willing to accept that my bias may be blinding me in some substantial way. That's why I'm more than ecstatic to be covering a game that no one in their right mind will ever argue is a survival horror game. As a third-person, squad-based multiplayer shooter, Operation Raccoon City contains nothing that made either the third-person or fixed-camera RE games famous, and so far that has never been disagreed upon. Even though I know me saying this guarantees exactly that happening in almost every comment on this video. <sighs> oh well, we might as well jump in. What's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Welcome to the Resident Evil Retrospective. Around about 2010, Capcom's experience in developing the second Lost Planet made them imagine what this type of game would be like if set in the Resident Evil universe. But that very same development period made them realize that they may not be the best people for the job. And so developer Slant 6, famous for making a few Socom games and absolutely nothing else, somehow warmed their way into making this dream a reality. The idea was to take the dev's experience with online tactical shooting and point it in the general direction of RE. And well, they sort of succeeded, depending on your criteria for success. I'd love to tell you a little more about the development process, but this was such a boilerplate, uncontroversial situation that no one was really interested in chronicling it. The only info I was able to find was a quote from producer Masachika Kuwata saying it was very hard to make an RE game without any survival horror in it, which we all know is horseshit since Capcom has been in the business of doing just that since RE4. Whatever criticisms I have for this game, be they deserved or just fanboy crying, I can say one thing for sure. It has a genuinely interesting premise. The general idea is you play as a team of Umbrella Security Service, or USS, and in the beginning of the game you've taken part in the initial act of corporate betrayal that saw William Birkin starting the Raccoon City outbreak, and because of this Umbrella blames you for an entire city filled with the living dead. The rest of the game is spent fighting your way through streets packed to the brim with zombies and B.O.W.s, completing a series of missions to get rid of any evidence that could incriminate the pharmaceutical giant. In the line of duty, you come across characters from Ares 2 and 3 and members of the US military sent in to help with evacuations. I gotta say, this is a kick-ass premise. The idea of donning the mantle of an elite Special Forces member, running around an infected Raccoon City, fighting tooth and nail for your survival is an amazingly compelling one. And the best part is, the events of both RE2 and 3 leave more than enough room for this game to have been fully canon. We knew that aside from the UBCS, Umbrella had agents in play during the disaster, and if that's the case, they would definitely be interested in covering up any corporate involvement. Slant 6 Games really had a blank canvas to work with here, and I swear they damn near pulled off an incredible attempt at a story that totally fit in with the accepted RE timeline, except for one majorly stupid move. One dumb inclusion that toppled the Tower of Cards that was a really cool Resident Evil story. At one point in the game, Delta Team ends up having a run-in with Leon Kennedy, and while this was clearly a fan service moment and nothing else, it still took away from any chance of this being a canon story. Now, when I first experienced this, I was so stuck on liking the initial coolness of being a Spec Ops team shooting up downtown Raccoon City, I was ready to dismiss it. That is, until the end of the game, when it's possible to kill Leon and Claire, then abduct Sherry Birkin. Now, sure, I might be a little unreasonable for getting so pissed off over an alternate universe slash what-if scenario, but we came so damn close. The general idea of the story was a really interesting one, and the characters, despite having almost no in-game backstories, have these interesting personalities and quirks. It's pretty clear that they're not acting out of some altruistic devotion to their teammates. In fact, they're all pretty bad people. 
the kind of antagonist you'd be rooting against if you weren't playing as them. <sighs> Do not touch me. There is this incredible amount of untapped potential here, and I really don't know if it's Capcom or Slant 6 that holds the blame, but either way, every good thing I could say about this story is surrounded by about five bad things. And if you think that's a mixed bag, just wait till you hear about the gameplay. So I'm gonna level with you guys here. This has been the hardest time I've ever had trying to sum up my feelings on a game. Operation Raccoon City is filled with just as many good ideas as bad ones, but let's cover the easy stuff first. Much like Slant 6's other games, this is a squad-based third-person shooter. At the start of a mission, you choose a weapon, a passive or active skill, and of course, a character. As you might assume, you can buy and upgrade your way to a better arsenal with points earned from playing well and finding secrets hidden throughout a mission. And that's about it. It's pretty straightforward, which makes me wonder how in the hell they managed to shit the bed so hard. Even very simple aspects of third-person shooting seem to be broken in this game, and the worst part is, they are very hard to show you with gameplay footage. To the usual viewer, what you're seeing here is just someone playing the game poorly, but I swear it's only a little bit of that. It seems like consistency is really the big issue. Sometimes hitting spacebar will pull out your sidearm and allow you to auto-aim at an enemy near you, making for a really cool way to back out of trouble while putting down a bunch of zombies. Of course, that's how it works sometimes. Most of the time, I hold spacebar and nothing happens, so I have to waste precious seconds repressing it so the game can realize that I ever hit it in the first place. Now this wouldn't really be a modern third-person shooter without a sprint button, and sure enough, holding shift does just that, but you can also dive in any direction by pressing E during a sprint. Now there are two insanely big problems with this. First off, there are plenty of enemies that can lunge at you, and having to press one button and then another slightly afterwards just does not naturally come to mind under stress. The second, and even more flagrant issue, is that button that activates the dive is the same button used to pick up health and ammo. So if you're running away because you're out of ammo and try to pick something up on the way, well you better get comfy because you're about to sit through an insanely long getting up animation. Once you finally do get up, you may want to take part in the early 2000s worst contribution to gaming, cover-based shooting. Well, the good news is this isn't the worst implementation of the mechanic I've ever seen, but the bad news is it's not the most reliable thing in the world either. This flavor of cover-based nonsense has you automatically taking cover when you get near anything taller than your waist. The issue is this happens to every wall you get close to, and every time you try to leave a doorway without perfect positioning. Now, I know that sounds really frustrating, and sometimes it can be, but to be honest, it seemed to stay out of my way for the most part. One thing that didn't, though, is the keyboard and mouse controls. This game was clearly made for controllers first and foremost. When looking around with a mouse, there's all kinds of jitter, kind of like they just dumped mouse support on top of something that clearly needed an analog stick to work with. Of course, there's a flip side, as you'll obviously have more control over aiming when you use a mouse. When I switched to the Xbox 360 version, I noticed that I often just aimed at the enemy's torso and let my gun's recoil move it close to the head, but on PC, I was nailing headshots most of the time. All of these downsides, coupled with incredibly inaccurate weapons and damage seeming to be dealt out with dice rolls, you'd assume that this would make for a frustrating, unfun experience, and you'd be right, at least most of the time which is my cue to drop a bomb on you guys. Despite all the flaws I just described, this game is fun as hell. While it can be hard to get right with the sloppy controls and inaccurate shooting, the thrill of running into a group of zombies spilling out of some kind of boarded up storefront and then literally tearing them to shreds cannot be overlooked. Throughout most missions, you'll find plenty of situations that'll put you on the edge of your seat and you really can't deny the coolness of standing back to back with a small paramilitary squad while you're gunning down POWs in the streets of Raccoon City. This game will put you into some insanely chaotic firefights and then just dump a horde of zombies on the whole situation. And in the middle of finding a sweet spot between firing from cover and staying mobile enough that the zombies don't get any free hits in, I start to notice a smile at the corners of my mouth. Then I shoot some US soldier in the gut causing him to bleed which attracts the area's undead population right to him and that slight smile turns into a full-on evil grin. This really is a great experience, at least when the obvious lack of skill the devs had doesn't get in the way. I think the takeaway here is there's a reason for how infamous this game is. Any reviews you've seen that lambast it for being the work of novice game designers 
having poor recover mechanics, inaccurate weapons, and performance issues at every turn, well, they're all totally accurate. ORC has all the makings of a really bad game, but it can be an incredible time regardless. Maybe it's just me, but the concept of slowly stalking down some ruined Raccoon City street and hearing the groans of the dead in the distance as you see them spilling into the streets like ants kind of transcends the game's downsides. It seems to be just functional enough to allow for some really great moments, and for the $5 I spent on it, that's a pretty good return on investment. Operation Raccoon City continues its trend of being as bad as it is good with its presentation. In the same game, you're likely to see both simple textures repeated lazily and some amazing looking streets covered in debris and realistic looking damaged buildings. You've been looking at the PC version for most of this video, and I would definitely say that's the version I recommend, but don't you worry, you know we'll be comparing these ports later on. As far as character design goes, each member of the USS Delta team looks great and has a buttload of personality to their design. The blue light as a repeating element, while probably not the most practical thing in a military operation, looks cool as all hell and completes the high-tech black leather theme. Your main enemies, the US Special Forces members, may all look exactly the same, but that's not exactly unrealistic in army dress standards. Like I said before, environments in this game are all over the spectrum, but it seems like the outdoor areas fare the best. The lighting is great and you can tell they were designed with care. In direct contrast, indoor areas all seem to be really simple and just don't have too much personality to them, minus one section set in the RPD precinct. Just like I said in my Dark Side Chronicles review, back before we knew there would ever be an RE2 remake, little moments like this were the closest thing we had to experiencing that seminal game but with shiny modern graphics. And of course, you know we gotta talk about the zombies, who actually look and move pretty accurately. I love the inclusion of my favorite member of The Walking Dead, the female zombie from RE2. I thought this particular enemy looked so cool, I got her tattooed on my leg when I was a teen. On top of the zombies looking pretty great, they also have some cool dismemberment effects. Arms, legs, hands, and even whole torsos can be detached, which can look a little dumb on close-up inspection, but in a hectic firefight, seeing a group of corpses turn into a pink cloud of gore looks really damn cool. But on that same note, don't be surprised if you start shooting a zombie that's locked into one of your partner's melee animations, and they end up finishing the kill on a floating quarter of a body. One interesting thing I was able to notice is that the game doesn't seem to use Capcom's in-house MT Framework engine. In fact, the visual nature of this game and tons of shiny surfaces led me to believe this was made in Unreal, which was pretty common for console games of that era. But it looks like Slant 6 went with something I never heard of. The Hexane game engine was apparently developed by Slant 6 themselves, but it's not what I would call a powerhouse development tool. On the PC version of the game, I experienced frame drops from 75 FPS to around 50, and in the case of this underground lab, much lower. Now, this wasn't common, but I'm playing this on an overclocked Ryzen 7 1700 and a GTX 1070 Ti. Slowdown should be the furthest thing from what I see in this game. But hey, I've played games with inefficient engines before. No big deal, right? Well, yeah, until you play this on console. As you may already know, the game also shipped on the PS3 and 360, the latter of which we're looking at right now, and I have to say, this is a pretty daunting experience. Not only does the game struggle to stay above 30 FPS during hectic gunfights, but there is an insane amount of screen tearing to be found in areas that use too much resources for VSync to be enabled. Back when I originally reviewed this game, I played this very 360 version, and these downsides weren't enough to sour the experience, but now that I've played it on PC, I doubt I could ever go back. Other than slow down and screen tearing, these games are relatively similar. Obviously, the console version will be a 720p affair, but the differences in sharpness aren't going to be too easy to notice when the bullets and body parts start to fly. Obviously, I have to recommend the PC version over its console counterparts, but if you're not that sensitive to visual artifacts like screen tearing and a bit of slowdown, it's definitely not unplayable. The good news is you're not going to have to pay too much for either version. This game seems to be a case where the engine just couldn't keep up with what seems to be really great design. It should be commended for getting so many zombies on screen, but it would have been nice they would have considered whether or not they could actually pull that off. As long as you keep your focus on the well-designed player characters and cool gore effects, you'll be solid, but a part of me wonders how amazing this game could have looked and performed if only Slant 6 would have just used MT Framework instead, but there's no use crying over spilt milk. 
What we got wasn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but it definitely didn't feel like a full $60 release. Thankfully, the immense amount of bugs and glitches that existed on launch have been patched out of the game, but if anything, Operation Raccoon City shows that maybe Slant 6 should have hired programmers that could keep up with their creative team. Well guys, I'm kind of torn here. I can't tell you that this is a 100% great experience worthy of a full price purchase, but let's face it, this game is at bargain bin prices almost all of the time, and for that, it can be incredibly fun. Sure, it's unpolished and really amateur in a lot of ways, but you really can't beat the premise and general idea of being the only member of your team left alive as the zombie horde closes in. It really makes for some amazing moments, but the string connecting these parts are clearly fraying. If you want my opinion, maybe just wait for a Steam sale and give it a shot if you're a fan of third-person squad-based shooting, or you just want to wander the streets of a ruined Raccoon City while playing the part of the bad guys for once. If seeing a developer take gigantic liberties with the series source material triggers you, I'd say stay away from this and maybe DC Comics while you're at it. But other than that, this is a really fun, if not uneven experience. I guess all I can muster up is a kind of, sort of recommendation. And with that sour note, I have to get back to work. The very last game in the official RE series is coming up next, and I'm sad to say, it's the infamous Umbrella Core. A game that I've actually never played before, but seems to be the worst thing that's ever been made if the internet's to be believed, so I hope to see you guys there suffering through it with me, right here on the Resident Evil Retrospective. Hey guys, thanks for swinging by once again. If you like the retrospective, I have videos from both my Resident Evil and Parasite Eve series right here, and maybe check out my Patreon to support more projects just like this. Speaking of patrons, if you're watching this and are already rad enough to be backing me, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This series wouldn't exist without you. Thanks guys, and I'll see you all next time.